Hello students, and welcome back to another lecture for sexualities and social issues. So today, we are going to talk about the social control of sexuality. And honestly, that's basically what this whole class is about. It's kind of our central theme, the ways that society controls sexuality both through social means and through legal means. And so today, we're going to focus on these three main questions. First, why do we control sexuality? Why do we care? Why do we care? Second, Whose sexuality do we control? Do we control every single person's sexuality? Maybe just some people? Which leads us to our third question. Do we control everyone's sexuality equally? Are we as concerned about the sexual escapades of every single person in society? The answer, of course, is no, but we'll talk about it. So the first thing that I want you to do today is kind of weird, but I'd like for you to pause the video and write down all of the insults that you can think of for women and all of the insults that you hear people use for men. So basically, it doesn't have to be things that you say yourself. I'm sure you're all delightful people. But if you would, just pause and think about the insults that you are used to hearing for both women and for men. And when we come back, I'll tell you why. So, I hope you came up with some good insults during that pause. And one of the things that I'd like for you to do now is to look at your list and see how many of those insults are sexual in nature. Specifically, how many of the insults that you thought of for women were sexual in nature, suggest that the woman has sex, and specifically, of course, that she has too much sex? How many of the insults that you wrote down for men are sexual in nature? And if so, do they suggest that he has too much sex? Do they suggest that he has too little? Do they suggest that he acts in some way like a woman? Were some of the insults for women based on them acting like men? Basically, what you probably noticed is that we have a lot of insults for women that are based on how much sex they have. And of course, the answer is always, if you've had any, it's too much. But we don't really have any insults for men that suggest that they've had too much sex. You might call them like a player or something like that, but in a weird way, that's kind of a compliment. So basically, when you look at your list, I want you to really think about whether those names mean something besides what they look like on the surface. Whether they're aggressive, whether they're controlling, whether the things that you thought of that we use specifically to make people feel bad are somehow related to sex. So, once you're finished with that, let's go on to the next thought, which is intersectionality. So, this is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, it's the intersection of multiple things. And specifically in sociology, we're looking at the intersection of multiple social demographics. So like I said in the beginning, we are primarily concerned with race, class, and gender. And intersectionality has a lot to do, especially with race and gender. So this picture is of Patricia Hill Collins, who's an amazing genius, and she wrote this book called The Politics of Black Womanhood, in which she really fleshed out this theory that basically it's hard to be a woman, but it's even harder to be a black woman. This relates heavily to sexuality. If you think about the insults that you used earlier, imagine if you were doing a study where you watched to see which women those insults were used on. I'll give you a hint. We use a lot more insults for women of color than we do for white women. This is part of our sort of bigger social issue with racism and our feelings about non-white people in America. So basically, intersectionality looks at the ways that being something combined with something else can make it exponentially worse. And of course, usually it's being black in addition to being a woman, but wealth enters into it too. Imagine if you were born black, a woman, and poor. It might not be hard for you to imagine, that might be you, but that means that you are sort of triple striked. <laughs> you have three strikes against you, uh, and that's a very hard thing to sort of emerge from and become socially successful. So one of the things that I want you to think about while we're talking about gender and while we're talking about sexuality is whether other things impact that too whether wealth enters into it, whether race enters into it, whether location enters into it. Because very often, even though we think we're talking about one thing, there are a lot of social issues that will sort of pile on. So intersectionality can be a little complicated, but it's very important. Another thing we're gonna talk a lot about today in regard to social control has to do with the difference between social control and legal control. So they are related. We don't generally bother controlling something legally unless we care about it socially. But I do want to make a point that they are different because social control is heavy and it's impactful, but you're not going to get thrown in jail for being a slut, right? You'll just get sexually ostracized. So one way to think about it is that social control has a lot to do with like positive affirmations and negative affirmations. It has a lot to do with being rewarded or punished. 
you might be a good person sexually, which means, of course, having very little sex for women and a lot of sex for men, and for that you'll get praised. Or you might be a bad person sexually, which means, of course, the opposite, having too much or too little sex, at which point people will say negative things about you. So again, this isn't legal. You can't be thrown in jail for having a bad reputation, but it can have major social impacts, and we do care about it a lot. We care about our reputation, about our place in society, about what other people are thinking about us. So the social control of sexuality can be incredibly powerful. Usually it comes from the people who are sort of in our circles. It has a lot to do with your family, with your friends, but it does also have to do with the rules from wider society. So it has a lot to do with where and when you are in terms of right now being in America in the 21st century, but it also has a lot to do with very specifically where and when you are. If you are in a small town that is full of evangelical Christians, you might see a different sort of control of sexuality than if you live in a big city where no one even knows where you are. So that's something we're thinking about, the way that social control can impact us hugely, but it doesn't necessarily have like palatable legal consequences. The difference, of course, legal control. So this has to do with what kind of laws we make. Um, typically, we can make something illegal or we can protect it. So once again, it has a lot to do with like negative and positive. If we like something, we can legally protect it or make it legal. If we dislike something, we can make it illegal or enforce laws that were already against it. So the legal control is sort of an escalation of the social control. The legal control comes primarily from, of course, the people who make the laws, the legislators, and the people who enforce the laws, the court system, and of course the police. So keep in mind that the legislators in America are democratically elected, which means that they are supposed to represent the values of the people who elected them. So legal control, again, is directly related to social control because, at least in theory, the people who are making the laws are making them based on what their constituents want. So again, legal control and social control do overlap a lot in terms of like a Venn diagram, but they are still two different things. So we're gonna start with the social control of female sexuality. And this is because we control female sexuality really hard. We're obsessed with it. So there are kind of two primary ways that we control female sexuality, and they both have to do with shame. So let's start with body shaming. So you've probably heard about body shaming lately. It's sort of having a moment where we're recognizing that it exists and we're recognizing that it's harmful. But basically body shaming is when you insist that someone's body is not good enough. And the issue with body shaming is that pretty much no matter what you do, your body is not good enough. It's pretty much a trap. You are definitely too fat or too thin, or you're too light or too dark, or you're too tall or too short, or you're not curvy enough or you're too curvy. It's basically always a trap and whichever body you have is the worst body. So one thing that's kind of interesting about this is that we are starting to pay attention to this in terms of who is sexy and who gets to be sexy. So if you look at these ads, basically the Victoria's Secret ad is talking about love my body. So it sounds promising. It sounds like loving your body, the body that you're in. And you'll notice that they have women of all different races and skin tones represented. But if you look a little bit harder, you'll notice that basically all of their bodies are the same. And then it turns out that body is actually the name of the like brand. <laughs> so when they say love my body, they mean love my specific bra. So in response, the company Dove that makes soap put out this ad real beauty, the opposite of body shaming, right? You'll notice that some of the women are heavier than others or shorter than others. And again, they made an intentional mix of race and ethnicity. But if you look even more closely at the Dove ad, one of the things that you'll notice is that there's still really not a lot of diversity here. These women basically top out at probably a size 14. And that's interesting because the average body size in America right now is 14. But what that means is that half of women are bigger than 14, and half of women are smaller than 14. So if you have an ad claiming to be body positive, but you're still only showing half of women and the acceptable half of women, are you really being body positive? So body shaming is pretty complex because it's kind of built to make you feel bad about yourself. And why should you feel bad about yourself? Why might that be helpful to society? because one way to fix your body so that you don't have to be ashamed of it anymore is to buy products. So in sociology, very often we ask ourselves, who benefits? When we see something happening and we think it might be kind of weird, you have to wonder who benefits from this thing happening. 
And the people who benefit from us all hating our bodies are basically the people who sell us products to fix our bodies. Makeup, skin lightening creams, butt lifting leggings, uh, those shakes that are meant to give you a small tummy. And for the record, all they do is make you poop and poop and poop and poop and poop. So it looks like you lost weight, but you really just lost a bunch of water and it's tremendously unhealthy, so don't do it. But the products that we buy in order to make ourselves look better, to make ourselves more sexy, to make ourselves sexually acceptable is a major part of why body shaming still exists. It's a hugely profitable thing to tell women that they are not good enough, but you can make them better. The other primary way that we control the sexuality of women is slut shaming. So this is very similar to body shaming. Basically, it means no matter how much sex you've had, you've had too much. Basically, unless you are having sex within a heterosexual marriage specifically for procreation, you've definitely had too much sex. And this is impossible, and it's silly, and it's unrealistic. But it is a useful way of controlling other people. Because it means that you are essentially controlling what they think is right. And it means that you can control what they've done and what they haven't done. And for a lot of women, this is a very heavy weight. This idea that other people are talking about you and they're judging you and they're finding you lacking. So in a lot of ways, slut shaming was best expressed in a very old movie that you might not have seen called The Breakfast Club. And one of the characters says that it's a trap. Essentially, if you say you haven't had sex, you're a prude. If you say you have, you're a slut. And what's weird is that even though this movie was made in the 80s, it's still true. It's still true. Basically, you're only allowed to have a little bit of sex with one person, and nobody does that. So you're almost definitely going to mess it up on some level. Another way to think about this is the way that we do typically associate it with the female body. So for instance, in modern America, we essentially assume that the more of your skin we can see, the more slutty you are. And this is interesting because technically one has nothing to do with the other, right? Like people can be completely naked and not have anything to do with sex, or they can be fully clothed and want to have sex. So the idea that the amount of skin that you're showing lends some like credibility to people sexualizing you is a very American thing that we are just now sort of beginning to address. So basically slut shaming suggests that no matter how much sex you've had, you're definitely a bad person for having had any at all. It's a trap. One of the unfortunate consequences of slut shaming is that it does essentially divide women into two categories. And in sociology, often we call this the Madonna whore complex, which means that either you can be Madonna, not the singer, the virgin mother of God, or you can be a whore. And this is quite tricky. And you've probably seen this sort of thing play out that basically you can either be a good girl or a bad girl. You can either be the kind of woman that you marry, that you take home to your mother, or you can be the kind of woman that you have sex with and then never see again. Again, this is very tricky because to put women into only two categories is not only limiting, it ends up badly for everyone involved. A lot of men have a really hard time with the concept of having sex with their own wives because they've been taught for so long that having sex is dirty and women who have sex are dirty. So we see this prop up all the time, especially with young people who have had abstinence-only education or young people who've been really involved in the kind of religious teaching that says that sex is bad. When they're finally allowed to have sex, they're baffled and they feel dirty and they hate it. So basically, the Madonna whore complex argues that women have to fit into one of two categories. And the good ones essentially never get to have sex, and the bad ones only get to have sex, and never the two can meet. So this, again, is a bizarre way to think about it, and it's definitely a trap. And I would encourage you to try to think of some examples of this, because I imagine you've seen them. The next thing that we'll talk about is how race factors into it. So this is essentially what I was talking about when I was talking about intersectionality. So basically, the social control of sexuality differs with gender, definitely, but it does also differ with race. So let's look at a couple of examples. And again, I encourage you to think of some on your own, because I imagine you've seen this in real life. So first, let's look at white women. For white women, basically, you can never be too thin or too young. That's what all of our grandmothers told us. I imagine you've heard it before. But there is a lot of pressure on white women to maintain a certain level of thinness, and there's also a certain pressure to not visibly age. So for white women to be sexually desirable, you do need to be relatively thin and you do need to be relatively young. For women who cannot achieve that, for instance, women who are heavier or women who continue to age every day at the rate of one day a day, this can be difficult. 
This is why we see so many women going for plastic surgery or skin rejuvenation techniques and things like that. Because basically we become concerned that if we get too large or too old, no one will want to have sex with us anymore. Is this true? No, but that's what the ads tell us. A lot of the ads that you see on television are directed at white women because especially we're concerned. What about black women, you ask? It gets even more complicated here. And the unfortunate truth is that we do have a long history in America of sexualizing black women in ways that they did not want to be sexualized. So this goes all the way back to the hot and top Venus, who was a woman who was from Africa, who was essentially captured and brought back to England to be put on display. Literally, men wanted to come look at her because her body was so different than that of the English women. It was almost like looking at a zoo animal, which is horrifying in retrospect, but was really common at the time. So very often for black women, this kind of portrayal continues. This idea that they are different, that they are exotic, that they are somehow less than human does continue to play out in lots of different ways in regard to the sexuality of black women. It's also worth considering the extent to which we ask them to stand up to white standards. So for instance, a lot of black women feel pressured to straighten their hair. And this is a pretty complicated process and it involves a lot of chemicals and heat and time and it's expensive. So by asking people to do something like this, to so dramatically and often permanently change their hair just to fit in, we are obviously putting them at a disadvantage. So of course, all women are already at a disadvantage in terms of being asked to be sexy because it's very expensive, but there is an additional sort of heaviness on women who are trying to achieve white European standards because they were told they have to. So one thing that I think is very important to consider when we think about the sexuality of black women is that first, we tend to kind of thrust it upon them whether they want it or not. And second, we turn around and ask them to live up to standards that are almost unachievable. So the sexuality of black women is a very complicated issue, and it's one that I'm really glad to see people starting to talk about and acknowledge and like take control of themselves. So what about Asian women, you ask? Even worse, in a lot of ways. One of the things that's really difficult for Asian women is what's called the sort of geisha ideal, this, this sort of theory that all Asian women are submissive, and they're delicate, and they're pretty, and they're flowers, and they definitely want to serve you tea. It's weird, we're not sure what's going on there, but there again has been a long history, especially in America, of sort of exoticizing Asian women. You might hear people talk about exclusively dating Asian women. I hate to use this word, but you've probably heard of yellow fever, which is when especially white men want to date exclusively Asian women because they find them to be exotic and they believe them to be better partners because they assume that they'll be submissive. Again, it's a very dangerous stereotype. You might also have seen lately that Asian women are thought to come in sets. This is a new thing because of K-pop, which has become gigantic and huge and popular. But the idea here is that if you can't tell Asian people apart, which is again, another stereotype about white people, then you might as well get the whole set. So as you can see, this is very much an object of sexualization, but again, it has a lot to do with objectification, with turning these human women into objects that you could buy, a whole set that you could buy. So finally, let's talk about Latina women. So the whole, you know, sort of Latinx population is really struggling in America right now. Uh, one of the things that we do repeatedly in America is we get mad at whoever is the most recent wave of immigrants. Um, it doesn't matter who they are, we hate them for a little while. So in America right now, we're very concerned about Latina women. And technically, we put them into two categories. You can be the invisible maid, or you can be the spicy Latina. And this is silly, because neither one of them are necessarily good. Like, these aren't compliments that we're giving women. Either you are invisible, and you blend in, and you're there all the time, and you take a subservient role, or you are fiery, and you have uncontrollable passion, and you're deeply sexual. And again, no person is just one of those things. So the idea that we ask Latin women to be either hugely sexual all of the time or invisible is a great example of the way that we socially control their sexuality based on assumptions about their race. So again, social control does have a lot to do with race and ethnicity because typically, again, in American culture, we make assumptions about what people like and what people are, and we don't base those in reality. So it can be hugely problematic. So next, let's talk about the control of male sexuality. 
This is always an interesting topic because sometimes I think we don't consider how much we control male sexuality. We spend a lot of time talking about the ways that we control women, but the truth is that our male version of sexual control is also a cage. It's a very difficult thing, I think, for young men to grow up feeling like they need to live up to norms of masculinity, especially in regard to sexuality. Because with men, we expect them to number one, want sex all the time, and number two, not want to have feelings about it. And this is so difficult. I feel like sometimes one of the primary things I teach in this class is that women like sex too, and guys have feelings too. So for instance, let's look at this meme. Basically, the argument here is that no man has ever said that he can't have sex because his head hurts. And it's sort of a joke about how women would say like, oh, I can't have sex because I have a headache. And the argument here is that there is no man who would turn down sex, no matter how much his head hurt, no matter what was going on in the rest of his body. And again, that's fundamentally untrue. Men are also humans. But we are so concerned about the availability of male sexuality and about its constant presence that we actually control male sexuality really hard. So let's start with a sort of policing of sexuality. So essentially what we say, especially in sociology, is that men have to actively prove their masculinity. If you are not actively being masculine and heterosexual, people will begin to make jokes about you being feminine and about you being gay. You may recall that for a long time it was really popular to suggest that something was dumb or someone was dumb by saying that it was so gay. They're so gay, that's so gay. It was a weird moment in time, we don't really say that as much anymore, but it used to be pretty much a stand-in for being bad and undesirable. So for men, they have to sort of constantly go about proving their heterosexuality. They have to constantly reference women or reference sex or reference other things that we associate with heterosexuality, or else they'll be accused of being other. So this is an exhausting process for men. Sometimes I think they would probably just like to chill, but we're constantly policing their sexuality to make sure it exists. Next, we police their masculinity. And we did talk about this a little bit in the sense that masculinity has so much to do with heterosexuality and proving it, but I wanted to specify that masculinity is really important to Americans. But the problem is that right now, very often our definition of masculinity is extremely limited. So for instance, in this meme, he's arguing that he doesn't even have feelings and he's never heard of them. And that is a traditional holdout of masculinity. We think that men are stoic and they're calm and they don't cry and they don't laugh. But asking men to be that way is incredibly limiting for them. And a lot of men really struggle with that because they do have feelings and they do have emotions. And asking them to bottle all of that up all of the time and never talk about it always ends poorly. So the amount of time that we spend policing masculinity can end up being really dangerous, especially in regard to sexual relationships. Because sex does come with feelings. I know we talk a lot about hookup culture and casual sex, but you're a human, you're gonna have feelings. And so by asking men to number one, not have feelings, and number two, not talk about them, we're really placing a lot of limitations on how healthy they can be, on how healthy they can be as a partner. And we've seen a lot of damaging fallout of this. A lot of men who just couldn't stay in healthy relationships because they weren't able to process what was going on. So one thing that I want you to think about carefully in regard to policing masculinity is when you see it in real life. So kind of keep your eyes and ears open for the next couple of days and think about what you hear people saying to other men or what you hear people saying to young men, even children. We're very serious about policing masculinity because we're pretty sure that if you don't do it right, there's gonna be a negative consequence for you. We do also body shame men. And we will talk a lot more about this in the section on the sexualization of bodies, but I did want to point out that the ways that we body shame men are especially unfair because the two main things that we associate with a lack of male sexuality are being short and having a small penis. And the problem is that you can't fix either one of those things. People have tried. There are all sorts of surgeries out there. But basically, if you can see in these memes, girls don't like short guys and People associate large penises with good things. You've probably heard this phrase lately about big dick energy, which I love because it's a bizarre piece of slang. But basically the idea is that people who have larger penises are somehow more powerful and more gregarious and more you know, attractive and that sort of thing. So the amount of body shame that we put on men is a really hard thing for them because you can put on muscle, you can lose weight, you can achieve a lot of the things that we ask men to achieve. 
but you cannot choose to be taller, and you cannot choose to have a larger penis, and you cannot choose to have a bigger beard. Basically, a lot of the body shaming that we do for men is extra harmful because of the ways that they're not able to fix it. So let's talk about the way we police sexuality according to race for men. So again, we'll start with white men. Basically, in order to be considered sexually attractive for white men, you kind of have two options. And one is to be really good looking and tall, and the other is to be rich. So the idea here is that basically women only want men who are either extremely good looking or rich enough to take care of them. And again, this is very limiting for men. It throws all other considerations out the window. Like, are they nice? Are they funny? Who cares? The consideration seems to be, are they tall? Are they rich? So the way that we tend to sexualize white men, again, has a lot to do with things that you might not be able to achieve. So basically, there is a concern about aging, and of course there is a concern about bodies, but it is still in some ways achievable because you can always just be rich enough to attract someone. Next, let's talk about black men. So again, the sort of expectations that we put on black men in regard to sexuality are almost impossible to achieve. Because the primary one that we all hear jokes about is that black men have large penises. And do they? No, not any larger than like anybody else statistically. But we assume that they will, we make songs about how they will, we make jokes about how they will. And so for a lot of black men, when they have an average size penis, or God forbid a smaller than average penis, they find it to be almost a mark against their character. Like a bad thing about them as a person, instead of just one body part that is among other body parts. So again, it's a really difficult standard for anyone to live up to because there's nothing you can do about it. We also often portray black men as kind of slutty. And especially there's this argument that if they are wealthy or if they are powerful or good at something, that they will surround themselves with women. There's a lot of talk about what race those women should be, for instance, but there's sort of this assumption that they will be a player, that they will not be monogamous, that they will have a whole stream of women coming towards them all of the time. And again, this is a lot of expectations. A lot of men don't want to date multiple people at once. A lot of men find that the women don't flock to them and then they get concerned. So asking people to always have these two things in order to prove their sexuality is once again an impossible task. It gets even worse for Asian men. There are kind of, again, two stereotypes about Asian men, and one is that they don't do a lot of dating. Very often you'll hear jokes about how Asian men can't get dates, or they're unattractive to white women, or they're unattractive to Asian women too. So sometimes the first hurdle that they're up against is that we often don't sexualize Asian men. If you think about the leading men in movies that you've seen, very often Asian men are asked to be either a ninja or a computer nerd, and that's kind of it. The movie Crazy Rich Asians did a lot for this. We finally started to see like Asian men in leading roles who were sexualized and seen as romantic partners. But prior to this, it's been a really rough road for Asian men to be considered sexually desirable and to be considered leading men. The other joke that we hear a lot about is that all Asian men have small penises. And again, statistically, not much smaller than anybody else, like maybe a little bit smaller, but we're talking about fractions of an inch. So obviously that's not a real concern, but that is something that we hear about a lot. So for a lot of Asian men, they feel like they just can't even get ahead because they can't even get a date to prove that they're interesting and nice and sexually attractive. Finally, when we come to Latino men, again, you kind of have two options. You are either the invisible employee, you know, you're the landscape guy, you're the janitor, basically no one knows who you are and you don't exist, or you're a scary criminal. So again, we tend to hate whichever wave of immigration is the most recent one, so Hispanic men are considered very scary. Uh, you know, recent presidential administrations have argued that we should be afraid of them, that they are all criminals and rapists. They've very often been portrayed in the news as like coming to get you. This is of course not true. Hispanic men tend to be like largely family oriented and job oriented and they don't commit a lot of crimes. But whatever, that's not what we're being told and that's what's important here. So again, very often, the sexuality of Latino men is controlled by fear that they're going to be criminals or by just subjugating them to like service roles. Again, if you think about leading men, especially leading men in like romantic films, we don't see a lot of Hispanic men in like popular blockbuster movies getting the romantic lead. So again, for men, we do control their sexuality based on their race in much the same way that we do for women. So next, let's talk about the social control of heterosexuality. 
So this may not seem obvious, because we pretty much assume everyone is heterosexual and our society is designed for people who are heterosexual, but we still are very careful about controlling it in the ways that we want to see. So first, let's start with the assumption of heterosexuality. Very often, if we don't have any other information about someone, we just assume they're heterosexual. And to be fair, statistically, this is not a bad bet, the majority of people are, but it still can be quite limiting, because one of the things that we assume when we assume that people are heterosexual is that they like the same things everybody else likes. We assume that all heterosexuals are interested in these women with the soccer outfits, or we assume that all heterosexuals want to see the variety of men shown in the movie Magic Mike. And this, of course, is not true. There's a huge range of what we like and what kind of sexuality we want to participate in, but it's very common to assume that people are straight and to assume that they like a very specific kind of thing. So in this graph, they're measuring how many of the characters on TV are straight versus how many people identify as straight. So on the left, you'll see that about 8% of the characters on TV that they measured were LGBTQ, which is basically everybody but straight. Whereas on the right, they said that 42% of 13 to 20 year olds don't identify as heterosexual. They identify as gay or lesbian or queer or whatever. So their argument, based on a survey that I haven't looked at, so I can't vouch for it, is that straight people are overrepresented in the media because increasingly, especially young people, don't necessarily identify as straight. And again, this makes sense. If you assume that everyone is straight, you're gonna make TV based on what you think they want. Another thing that you might have heard about lately is this concept that we are spending too much time on people who aren't straight. There's this argument that we don't have celebrations of heterosexual culture. You may have seen this meme before where she talks about how her culture celebrates heterosexuality but she doesn't have a parade. And that's kind of an interesting example because people do get mad when they see other kinds of things celebrated. These people on the right really did have a straight pride parade. They went out and marched through the streets of Boston. They have since been arrested because it turns out they were also white supremacists, but you know, those two things do kind of tend to go together. So we do celebrate heterosexuality in a lot of ways, but sometimes it's so assumed that it looks like the celebration is really low key. So you could argue that having the vast majority of couples who are on television be heterosexual is a celebration of heterosexuality. But sometimes when we celebrate something else, people get worried that they're gonna be sort of flattened or forgotten. So this becomes kind of an interesting and tricky issue. Another way to think about the popularity of something in a culture is to measure how much advertising is directed to it and how much marketing is assuming that people will want that thing. So for instance, if you think about pink toys for girls and blue toys for boys, that would be an example. Another example would be that often when we see things sold in sets, there's an assumed heterosexuality. So for instance, this set of mugs says bride and groom. Could you get mugs that said bride and bride and groom and groom? Probably, but they're probably not at Walmart. Similarly, this comforter suggests that there's a his and a her side of the bed. And I do like the way that the her side of the bed is like 80% of the bed, but again, it assumes heterosexuality. So this is an example of the way that we sort of socially assume that people are heterosexual and we continue to make products that reinforce that heterosexuality and sell them to each other. Another way that we tend to control heterosexuality has to do with the heterosexual timeline. So this is kind of interesting because this already exists in your brain, even though you might not know it. So if you think about it, you probably know this nursery rhyme. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage, right? You've heard it. And this is one of the ways that we control the behavior of heterosexual people. You are supposed to fall in love and then get married. What happens if you don't love the person that you marry? What happens if you fall in love after you get married? You are also supposed to have the baby after you get married. What happens if you don't have any babies? What happens if you have a baby without getting married? What happens if you have a baby without being in love? We don't like those things. This is especially interesting because it's incredibly common to have a baby outside of marriage or to have a baby with someone that you don't love anymore. But we still act like that's doing it wrong. We're very concerned with this. We're very concerned with controlling the way that people are heterosexual. So this is an example of the way that it sounds innocuous. It sounds just like a silly nursery rhyme. It sounds like what everybody on TV and the movies and the Disney movies do. But in reality, we don't necessarily live our lives this way. But we're still made to feel bad about it if we don't. 
So heterosexual marriage does come with certain rewards. There are both legal and social rewards for having gotten married. So the legal rewards are pretty clear. Uh, basically, you get social security payments if your spouse should die. You get tax breaks for being married. Um, you get the right to visit your partner in the hospital and make decisions about their care, which can be incredibly important. And of course, sometimes there are employee benefits. Sometimes married people make a little bit more money than unmarried people, even though they're doing exactly the same job, because there's this assumption that they have someone else to care for. I know it's weird and technically it's illegal, but it happens. The social benefits of getting married are also very real. Sometimes you're just taken more seriously. When you say this is my spouse instead of like my boyfriend or girlfriend, that has a lot more social weight to it. Sometimes you get taken as more of an adult. When you get married, you get to sit at the adult table. You get to talk about adult things. People really like that. Sometimes you get a special recognition of your vows. If you have a civil ceremony to marry someone of the same sex, people might act like that's not real. In America, we've really gotten the government involved in our marriages, which is its own weird thing. But basically, sometimes people think if you don't have that piece of paper, then your marriage is invalid. And of course, you might get higher social status. Again, people who are married are seen as more adult, and you have the option of marrying up, as they say, which means to marry someone who is of a higher social status than yourself. So basically, there are a lot of rewards for getting married, uh, both legal and social, which might be one of the reasons people keep choosing to do it. One way that we have socially and legally controlled marriage is who is allowed to marry who. So in America, for a very long time, people were not allowed to marry somebody of another race. Basically, if they found out that you and your spouse were of different races, they could nullify your marriage. So the people who brought this to the Supreme Court were the Lovings, who are adorable, and I will put a link on Blackboard so you can watch a whole story about them. But basically, it wasn't until 1967 that the Supreme Court decided that their marriage was legal and that therefore all interracial marriages were legal. And it's important to remember that that was kind of recent. Like, we act like that's ancient history, but that was when your grandparents, maybe even your parents, were probably considering getting married or at least were alive themselves. One thing to think about with this is that it took so long because Americans didn't want it. So if we look at this graph, this is a longitudinal graph, which means that it measures change over the course of time. There, we can see the change in whether people approved or disapproved of interracial marriage in the United States. So as you can see, when they first started measuring it in 1958, a whopping 95% of people disapproved of interracial marriage. But that number dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped until you can see in the mid 80s, people kind of changed their minds. Americans kind of shifted until up until two, uh, 2007. You can see that it's still only about 75% of people who agree with it. It's possible that that number has gone up since then, but I couldn't find the data. So here we are. Another thing worth considering is what type of interracial marriages we tend to see in America. So in this graph, you can see that, of course, since it's longitudinal, the amount of interracial marriages that we were measuring in the beginning has gone up hugely. In 1960, it was a relatively small amount. Uh, by 2015, it was a much higher amount. And some of this has to do with the way that we think about race. Increasingly, Americans are mixed race. And we used to still force people into categories in that regard. Like if you were, you know, mostly white, but a little tiny bit black, for whatever reason, we made you identify as black. But we don't do that in America much anymore. Most people instead just identify as mixed. So increasingly, the American population is mixed. So you'll notice, for instance, that one of the biggest categories in terms of interracial marriage is people who identify as essentially other, uh, or people who identify as mixed. So basically, there's a huge amount um, of Hispanic and white intermarriages, and there's a huge amount of sort of other, and the rest are sort of interspersed throughout. <clears throat> so there are some sorts of interracial marriages that are more popular than others, but that has a lot to do with what percentage of the population is made up of each race. There simply are a lot of white people available to intermarry, and there are a lot of Hispanic people available to intermarry. So that has a lot to do with what kind of marriages we see. Another interesting fact is that interracial marriage has gone up hugely with the advent of online dating. Basically, we're meeting people that we might not otherwise have met. 
Traditionally, people married uh, people who lived very nearby them or people that they were introduced to via their friends and family. But now it's really easy to meet strangers. Strangers from another part of town. Strangers from a totally different social world than yours. So one of the things that we're seeing is that there's a lot more interracial marriage as a result of that. Next, we'll talk about the social control of homosexuality. And this has been hugely heavily socially controlled. This is one of the things that we do tend to be socially kind of worried about. So one good example is the way that it's considered all over the world. So if we look at this map, we can see places where homosexuality can lead to imprisonment or a death sentence, for instance, in the countries represented by red. Countries in yellow have some anti-gay laws and they don't allow same-sex marriage. Countries in green have some sort of protection, uh, legal protection for marriage or union or partnership, even though it might not be performed everywhere. And then places where same-sex marriage is legal and that's reinforced. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of variation all over the world in terms of how people feel about homosexuality, how they feel about gay marriage, and it does have a lot to do with religion and social customs. So basically the way that we control homosexuality is one of the most rapidly fluctuating things of all in regard to American culture, but also in regard to worldwide culture. Another way to think about the control of homosexuality is to think about how we've controlled it over the course of history. So typically over the course of history, some cultures have allowed for it and others haven't. So often what we end up doing is just sort of quietly ignoring it. But again, it doesn't mean it hasn't existed. So for instance, in these portraits, we can see some relatively famous gay couples. On the left, here's Achilles and Patroclus. In the middle are two women who were in what's called a Boston marriage, which was when two women who were usually pretty well educated would live together as roommates for their entire lives. On the right is a Civil War era portrait of two Confederate soldiers. As you can see, they do have their hands on each other's thighs and it's long been assumed that that's because they were in a gay relationship. But one of the things we have historically done to people who were gay and who were in gay relationships was just quietly ignore it. So for example, it's pretty famous to make jokes about Achilles and Patroclus because it's very clear how much they loved each other, but historians typically gloss over that and act like they were just good buddies. Or what about King Ludwig? He was real gay, and he actually built Neuschwanstein for his lover, or more accurately for someone he wanted very much to be his lover. It didn't quite work out. But if you think about the most beautiful castle in the world, it was kind of an ode to a man who just wanted somebody else to love him. Sometimes we make famous men marry women just to sort of cover up their homosexuality. So you can see here that Rock Hudson married his secretary once upon a time, and Elton John even married his secretary once upon a time. So for a long time in America, even if people were gay, if they were celebrities, we made them keep it on the down low. Is this still true? You might argue that it is. Our ideas about this kind of thing do tend to change slowly, and it does have a lot to do with race and ethnicity and wealth. Another thing to think about in regard to the control of homosexuality is that sometimes we kind of just don't like it and sometimes we outright hate it. So there is a difference in regard to socially controlling something and being really awful about it. So for instance, heterosexism is basically the belief that heterosexuality is the best and perhaps the only one that should be acknowledged. Again, you might see this in regard to his and hers towels. Homophobia, on the other hand, is traditionally considered the fear of homosexuality, but it might also be considered the hatred of homosexuality. Often, people who are really worried about homosexuality are afraid that they are secretly gay. We'll talk about that later. But basically, there is a difference between assuming and preferring that one thing is good and between outright hating another thing for assuming that it's bad. So in America, we're definitely battling homophobia. We see this all the time, especially with people like the Westboro Baptist Church, but we are also battling a sort of low key version where people just assume that other people aren't gay or where they just make it a little bit more difficult to be gay. So that is something that's worth considering, how much we are controlling something that we vaguely disapprove of or how much we are controlling something that we outright disapprove of. The thing that's really interesting is that much like our interracial marriage ideas, it is changing over the course of time. So if you look at this graph, this is also a longitudinal graph, but this measures 
whether people think that same-sex couples should be recognized by the law as valid or not. Again, you'll notice that when we started measuring this, it was basically about two-thirds of people thought it shouldn't be valid and one-third thought it should, and there's almost a direct switch. So right around 2011-ish, 2012, basically Americans kind of changed their minds, and gradually we've been changing our minds even more, to the point where the majority of Americans accept gay marriage as legal and valid. So if you look at this next graph, they're measuring how much discrimination people face, and they're measuring people who are straight versus bi versus gay. So basically, uh, we're measuring women here on the left, and you'll notice that straight women, for instance, have experienced no discrimination based on their sexual orientation, but they have experienced some form of discrimination. However, when we measure that against lesbian women, you'll notice that they have experienced a lot of discrimination about their sexual orientation, but they've also just experienced a lot of discrimination in general. Similarly for men, you'll notice that the straight men have no discrimination regarding their sexual orientation, but the gay and the bi men experience a lot of discrimination, both based on their orientation and just sort of generally. So if you think way back to when we were talking about using gay as an insult, this is kind of part of that. Sometimes we discriminate against people based on their sexuality, and we say that. We say, we don't like you because you're gay. Sometimes we just don't say that part out loud. So people who are gay and out, or who are bi and out, do tend to face social discrimination. They might not be invited to family picnics anymore. They might not be promoted. They might not be welcome at specific churches. So even though the discrimination does not come out and say it by name, they do still face certain social discrimination because as a culture, we're still not totally okay with homosexuality. It's also important to remember that we have been controlling homosexuality with laws for a long time. Basically, in a lot of places, including America, it's been largely illegal to be gay. But there's been a lot of change to that in the last few decades. So I wanted to talk about a few of the really key changes and especially draw attention to the way that they're pretty recent. So if we look at this, in 1967, the ACLU reversed their position and decided to start representing people in cases of discrimination in regard to sexuality. Previously, the ACLU had not talk taken on any cases in regard to sexuality. In 1969, we had the famous Stonewall Riots, and this was outside the Stonewall Bar in New York, and it was really famous because basically police used to raid gay bars and arrest anybody who was in there, essentially for being gay. And what happened at the Stonewall Riots was that the people who were in the gay bar chased the police out, and then there was a huge, like, three-day riot protest. It was a big deal. But it was also a turning point, especially for gay rights in America. Next, in 1993, we had the Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So basically, this meant that if you were serving in the American military, you could be gay. Previously, that had been not allowed. If you had been found to be homosexual, you could have been kicked out of the military. But in 1993, Clinton passed this, and basically what it meant was that you just shouldn't ask fellow soldiers if they were gay, and if you are gay, you just shouldn't tell anyone. So it wasn't the best ever social protection, but it was an effort. In 2003, we saw Lawrence versus the state of Texas. And that was a really weird case because basically it was still on the books that it was illegal to have sex that was between consenting adults if those two adults were of the same gender. So it really wasn't until 2003 that they overturned that because really prior to that, the police could arrest you in Texas for having gay sex, even if you were both adults who had both consented. Then in 2010, people were given medical rights to visit their partners in the hospital or to make decisions about their care, especially if they had a legal union. In 2011, we got rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and decided that military members could just serve openly. We just were no longer concerned about their sexuality in terms of throwing them out. Then, in 2011, uh, we started to see that housing discrimination against gay families was made illegal. So again, it used to be a thing that if somebody was renting a house, they could just turn down a gay family because it made them uncomfortable. And so it wasn't until 2012 that they decided that everyone has an equal right to apply for housing. Then, in 2015, a great big old change. Oberfell versus Hodges was the Supreme Kate course where gay marriage was legalized. 
So this was a great big deal uh, because basically it meant that every state in the nation had to respect gay marriage. Prior to that, we've been doing it on a state-by-state -state basis, which is typically how we do make these decisions in America. But in 2015, it was decided that if you were married in one state, your marriage was valid in all the states. Finally, also in 2015, we made it legal for gay couples to adopt children. So prior to this, a gay individual could adopt a child, but a married gay couple or a long-term gay couple were not allowed to adopt the child together. So like one member of the couple would adopt the child, but the other, couple, other member of the couple didn't have any legal rights regarding the child. So they couldn't go to their school meetings necessarily, or they couldn't make decisions for them in the hospital. So that was really important because it gave gay couples who had adopted children a lot of legal protection so that they could take better care of those children. So basically, our treatment of homosexuality in regard to our laws has been changing really dramatically just in the last couple of decades. One thing that is important to mention, though, is that how we feel about homosexuality can change by your race and ethnicity. So basically, some races and ethnicities are a little bit more permissive than others, and it does have a lot to do with religion and with culture and tradition. But basically, one of the things that we're finding is that, for instance, it's a lot harder for Black Americans to come out, especially Black American men. Every time a major artist comes out as gay, there's a big fuss. I don't know if you remember when Frank Ocean came out, but it was a big deal. People were really kind of worried about this. We're only just recently starting to see gay black men get accepted in terms of the rap and hip-hop world. It's also largely unacceptable in certain Asian cultures. This picture was from a famous case where this man was offering anyone who could get his lesbian daughter to marry them a billion dollars. She ended up, you know, not marrying anyone and gradually he came to accept her homosexuality, but it was a great example of the way that he thought he could control her sexuality with money because it was preferable to him to pay someone to marry her than to have her be out and gay. So the way that we control homosexuality, especially socially, has a lot to do with what race you are and how your race and ethnicity feels about homosexuality. Finally, we're going to talk about our third favorite thing, wealth. So often in sociology, we talk about socioeconomic class. And that means that it's not just how much money you make, but also what kind of class you're in. I'm sure you've heard of people being new money or old money or something like that. And basically what that means is that sometimes your money is related to what kind of education you have and what kind of people you spend your time with and where you live. Sometimes it's not, but very often it is. So in regard to sexuality, we do have a lot of thoughts about how money and wealth plays into how sexy you are and what kind of things we expect you to do. So for instance, we spend a lot of time in America making fun of poor people. I imagine you've seen things like people of Walmart, and it's of course a deeply unfair and terrible thing for us to do, because even though social class mobility is real in America, it's still very difficult. So often we assume, for instance, that people who are poor are also not sexy. Whenever we show people being sexy in films or in movies, typically we also show them being wealthy. So if you think about the shows that you watch that tend to have sex scenes in them, those are probably shows that are about wealthy people. We tend to totally ignore the sexuality of people that we consider to be poor or people we consider to be country or something like that. So basically the amount of wealth you have really has nothing to do with your sex drive, but it does have a lot to do with whether other people think that you can even be sexy. Similarly, there are sometimes associated costs with having sex. There's always birth control, of course. Somebody should bring the condoms if somebody has a penis. But there's also accidental pregnancy. You might need to buy plan B or something like that. There's also the amount of grooming that's supposed to go into it, especially for women. We're going through a weird phase where we want everyone to be hairless. So if you are about to have sex, are you obligated to remove all of your hair? Are you obligated to wear nice underwear? Sometimes it can be very expensive to present yourself as sexual or to engage in the sex act itself. This tends to make people really angry. For instance, people are convinced that if you are on birth control, it might be because you're a slut. And furthermore, that if you are on birth control and it's covered by health insurance, that other people are paying for you to have sex. And this is, of course, not the case. There's a lot of medical reasons to be on birth control. And also, it's a lot cheaper just to pay for everyone to be on birth control. But you might have seen memes like this where people are saying that it would be cheaper for you to just shut your legs, or that people want the government to pay for their birth control because they can't afford it. And again, this is a really interesting social issue, because some people think, again, that no matter how much sex you're having, it's too much. 
And some people think that people who have sex are bad, especially women who have sex. So there is this argument that you shouldn't have sex unless you're able to afford it, which is incredibly tricky because generally, technically, the sex itself is free, but the associated costs with having sex can be insurmountable for people who have very little money. It can be difficult to afford birth control or to afford condoms or to afford looking nice so that somebody might think you're sexy. So this idea that you need to spend a certain amount of money to be sexy or you need to not have sex so that you don't end up costing other people money, it's a very tricky sort of social issue. And it is something that we're beginning to address when we talk about things like birth control and Obamacare and what we should pay for with our taxes. Another thing we're thinking about, again, in regard to the control of heterosexuality, is our expectation that people get married. But it's not enough that you get married, you have to have a wedding. So one of the questions worth asking is whether you can afford to have a wedding. It ranges hugely, of course. How much you spend on a wedding is very much up to you. But these days in America, it's expected that everyone will have a wedding and it will be a great big thing. A lot of people go into debt trying to afford the kind of wedding that they want to have because it's socially expected that the wedding will include a party. So for some people, they can't afford this. So they get married at the jail. For some people, they kind of find a medium line. They get married in their own backyard, but with decorations. And for some people, they spend an extraordinary amount of money because they are also trying to talk about how much wealth they have while not directly addressing how much wealth they have. So if you are the kind of person who rides into your wedding on an elephant, you're saying a lot about your social status. Just to be clear, the average wedding in America right now costs about $20,000. It ranges hugely, of course, depending on where you live. It's a lot cheaper to get married in some states than in other states. And of course, it ranges hugely based on your personal preferences. But considering that we expect every heterosexual couple to get married at some point, it's kind of interesting that we also expect them to spend a tremendous amount of money on it. And if you don't, again, the shaming will commence. So our final questions circle right back around to our first questions. Essentially, what you need to ask yourself is whose sexuality is the most carefully controlled? And again, it has multiple layers. The way that we control people legally can be different than the way that we control people sexually. The way that we control people based on their race can be different in terms of gender. It can be different in terms of wealth. It matters a lot where and when you are. Sometimes people are actively rebelling against the social control that they face. You may have heard about the slut walk, for instance, which is a way of sort of taking back the word slut and arguing that it's acceptable for women to be sexual. So whose sexuality we control the most does have a lot to do with power, and that is something that I think is very important for us to consider. So that ends our lecture for today. As always, if you have any questions, please email me, and I'll see you next time.